Hey everyone, hope you all doing great. Math of G with her. In this video, I'm going to discuss about machine learning project workflow. If you are the one who is aspiring to become a data scientist, hands-on experience is very important. Companies look for the people who have done a project. If you have a theoretical knowledge and if you are struggling to do a project, if you don't know how to do a machine learning project or what approach you have to take, then this video is for you. In this video, I'm just going to explain you the clear steps regarding like how actually the machine learning project is going to work. The very first thing, try to understand the business case. Where most of the people fail to understand this, this is very important. Try to understand the business case or a problem statement. Let's say for example, if you are given with a problem statement, something like build a relevant machine learning model in order to predict whether the person is diabetic or a non-diabetic. So you are predicting a person as diabetic or a non-diabetic. That means it belongs to a classification problem. If it's something, build a machine learning model to predict the price of in-house. Here we are predicting a price. Price is continuous, it's a number. So we're gonna use regression problem. If it's something like cluster entire data into our different groups, then we're gonna use clustering algorithm. This is how you know understanding business case plays a very important role. You'll get to know what type of algorithm should be applied for your problem statement. The second thing, try to import basic libraries. Importing libraries plays a very important role. So we have few libraries like you know, NumPy, which helps in creating arrays, pandas, helps in dealing with data frames, and also helps in uh, data manipulation. We have Seaborn and also matplotlib, which helps in visualization. And along with these four libraries, we have scikit-learn or an sklearn library, which helps in loading all the packages or a libraries related to machine learning and also pre-processing. The next step is load data. Obviously, when it's a machine learning, we need data. So the data will be in two form. That is, it can be in a CSV or it can be in an Excel format. So you can just use pandas to load that data, pd.read underscore csv or pd.read underscore excel to load csv and excel file. Once you load the data, you have to do the domain analysis. Domain analysis is very important. We see a lot of people switching towards just data science, uh, maybe from technical and non-technical. Not everybody can have a domain knowledge, right? Because this machine learning concept has been applied in all the domains, starting from medical till uh, finance, everyone are using this machine learning concept. So understanding domain is very important. When you take up any data, try to do some research, do some Google search, try to figure it out what exactly is the domain, what your data is telling about. So this understanding is very important. Okay, when I say domain, it can be of different thing. IT sector, people will be doing projects on agriculture, it can be implemented even in finance domain. Manufacturing companies are using transportation, retail industries, banking, and also medical industries are using this machine learning in order to make a prediction and also to make a better decision. So if you are from an IT sector, if you are doing project on a medicine domain or medical domain, obviously you should have a knowledge of medicine. So that's the reason, you know, domain analysis is very important. All right, the next thing is basic checks. Uh, try to understand the structure of a data by performing few basic stuff like, you know, sheep helps in finding number of rows and columns. Head will print you the first five rows. The tail will print you the last five rows. Head and tail basically helps in, you know, analyzing the data just by printing few records. Because when you have thousands of records, you can't look into everything, right? The next thing is info. Info gives information about, you know, uh, memory usage and D types gives an information about the data type of each column. Describe helps in doing statistical analysis. Unique helps in finding unique values. And value counts basically helps in finding the count of unique values. When I say unique, let's say if you have a gender column, if you want to know what are the unique values, unique categories, it's a male and female, right? That we use a unique. If you want to know how many male, how many females, in that case, you're gonna use value counts. The next step is exploratory data analysis. This is very important aspect of our machine learning. This is like a data analysis. So without understanding our data, without exploring our data, it's really hard to do any machine learning project. 
So try to explore data just by doing univariate analysis, bivariate and multivariate. Under univariate, we're going to analyze single variable. So when I say univariate or a single variable, we can check the distribution of a data using histogram. We can check whether data is balanced or not using count plot. We can check the arc layers using box plot. These are the different graphs you can plot under univariate. When I say bivariate, it's analyzing two variables. You can try with bar plot, scatter plot, line plot, box plot, violin plot in order to analyze two variables. When I say multivariate, it's analyzing multiple variables. You can try with you know, a heat map or a pair plot in order to analyze multiple variables. This is how you try to find the relationship between the variables and also you will figure it out what's the trend pattern available in our data by performing exploratory data analysis. Most of the questions can be answered just by doing you know, exploratory data analysis. So it's a very important aspect of machine learning project workflow. The next step is data pre-processing. You know, pre-processing is very important because when you take up any data, obviously it will not be clean. It will be a messy data, some irrelevant stuff will be there. So how do you clean that? So that basically done under data pre-processing. The very first thing, we look for missing values. So when I say data, obviously some information might be missing. So how do you overcome that? How do you handle that? So that's where the concept of handling missing values plays an important role. First thing, check in, check for a missing values. If there are any missing values, don't drop them. Dropping is not a good option because we might lose information. Either what you can do, you can replace it with a mean, median, or mode. When data is normally distributed, go with a mean if it's a numerical data. If it's a skew, go with a median. If it's a text kind of data, go with a mode. So this is how you handle missing values. The next one is check for the duplicates. If you have any duplicates or a repetitive values, just drop them. After you check for duplicates, you're gonna check for out layers. You know, out layers are nothing but an extreme values, which are like completely different from our actual data. Let's say for example, if I'm collecting data related to our students, each of our students, you know, like it will be around like 20 to 30. If you have a numbers like, you know, 100, 200, they're like an extreme values. You need to handle them. So how do you identify an out layers? You can use box plot, histogram, and a scatter plot. These graphs gives you the direction of an out layers. If you want to identify the out layers, out layer values, then go with either IQR method or three sigma rule. IQR is used when data is skewed. Three sigma rule is used when distribution is normal. Even here, you need to handle out layers only if percentage of out layers is less than 5%. You can replace either with mean or a median based on the distribution, whether it's a normal or a skewed. The next important thing is scaling. Scaling is always applied on distance-based algorithms such as KNN and K-mean. We're not going to apply scaling on a tree-based algorithm. It's applicable only for a distance-based algorithms. Scaling is important when you want to bring uh, certain values into a same scale. Let's say, for example, if you have a square feet, if you have a square feet, if you see a huge variation among the numbers, then you need to apply a scaling to bring all the values in a same scale. So it can be achieved in two ways. One is min-max scalar, which is a normalization method, which normalizes values into a range of zero to one. Standard scalar, it's one of the standardization. It uses a z-score and transforms all the values into a range of minus three to plus three, that is positive and negative values. And remember, outliers and scaling is always done on numerical data, that to a continuous data. The next important pre-processing method is converting categorical data into a numerical. When I say data, that will be a text kind of data. Before training your model, make sure you convert a categorical data into a numerical. So how do you do that? So we have several methods like label encoder. It just encodes according to the alphabetical order. One hot encoder, it we also call it like a dummies. It just creates a columns according to the categories and it just encodes. Manual encoder, manually we're gonna encode it based on a priority with the target. Frequency encoder, based on a frequency, we're gonna encode it. So these are the different pre-processing methods that one should perform as a part of machine learning project.
The next important step is feature engineering. Under feature engineering, what we do, we try to focus on, you know, selecting the best features. So we drop columns which are not really important. We create columns if required from existing ones. We select features based on a correlation and we select features based on feature selection techniques. Like we have forward selection, backward selection, feature importance. So these are the several methods that we can use in order to select the important features from a data. When you have hundreds of columns, it's not good habit to, you know, uh, the training machine learning model with all those hundred columns. Your model might overfit. To overcome that, what you need to do, you need to select the features which are really important. The next important thing is split your data. You know, when you take up any machine learning project, after cleaning, after exploring data, make sure you split your data for training and testing. This is very important because we always use 70% of the data for training and remaining 30% for testing. Similarly, you can try 80-20 rule. Splitting data is very important. Once you split a data, you have to balance data. Remember, this step is applicable only if it's a classification problem. It's not applicable for regression and a clustering algorithms. Balancing is very important. Let's imagine we have a diabetic data. You can see here data is imbalanced. We have more observations related to non-diabetic patients and less information related to a diabetic. So when you give, you know, when you don't provide a balanced data to your model, your model becomes a biased. To overcome that, you need to balance it. How do you balance? We have different approaches like undersampling, oversampling, but undersampling is not a good option because it might lose information. Oversampling just increases the duplicate. Instead, you can use the special method called as a smooth. It's one of the oversampling method which artificially synthesizes you know, observations in order to balance data. This is all about a balancing data. One important thing, try to apply smooth only on trained data. The balancing should not be done on testing data. The next important thing is build a model. Now you have to choose which model suits your data. So we have two types of machine learning algorithms, supervised and unsupervised. Under supervised, we have two things, regression and a classification. Go with a regression algorithm if data type of a target variable is continuous. So we have several algorithms under regression, such as linear regression, KNN, support vector, decision tree regressor, random forest, gradient boosting, and XGBoost regressor. These are the different regression algorithms we're going to use if data type of the target variable is continuous. Examples, house price prediction, sales prediction, flight price prediction, loan price prediction, and so on. If the data type of a target variable is categorical, that is a text or discrete, then go with the classification algorithms. Here we're going to classify data into different classes. We have a different algorithms like, you know, logistic, KNN, support vector classifier, decision tree classifier, random forest classifier, gradient boosting, XG boost, backing, and also naive's. These are the different classification algorithm we're going to use when target variable is categorical. What if you have a data without a target? For such data, we're going to use clustering algorithms. So we have different clustering algorithms such as like a k-means, PCA, a DB scan, and also hierarchical. These are the different clustering algorithms that you can use whenever you don't have the target variable in your data. So when you take up our different machine learning models, what you do, you'll train a model and you'll test a model. So once you train and test, you have to try with all the possible models and then you have to evaluate the model. This is a very important step. Without ev evaluating, you'll not get to know how good is your model. So evaluate the model. How do you evaluate? So for every specific algorithm, we have a different metrics. When it's a regression problem, so we have different metrics such as mean squared euro, mean absolute, root mean squared, R2 score, and adjusted R2 score. In regression, what we do in order to evaluate a model, we just take average of the error made by the model or we just take, you know, uh, average of all the mistakes made by the model. Error functions are mean squared euro, mean absolute and root mean squared euro. And R2 score and adjusted R2 score gives an information about, you know, how good is your model. It tells how better is your model. R2 score ranges 0 to 1. If it's near to 1, we see it's a good model. If it's near to C, we see if it's near to 0, we see it's a bad model. 
This was all about a regression. The next one is a classification matrix. So when I say classification, the evaluation is based on correct classification and a must classification. We figure it out like how many must classifications we have. So for that, we use confusion matrix. It just creates a matrix with true positive, true negatives, false positive, and a false negatives. Accuracy, it just, you know, it's a ratio or it's an average of the total predictions, correct predictions divided by the total predictions. It just tells you how good is your model. Use accuracy only when data is balanced. Precision score is used when false positives are important. When you want to focus on false positive, then go with the precision score. When false negative is important, when you really care about a false negative, go with the recall score. Go with an F1 score when both false positive and false negative is important because F1 is harmonic mean between precision and a recall. Use AOC and ROC curve when it's a binary classification in order to evaluate your model at various thresholds. So these are the different classification metrics that we're gonna use when it's a classification problem. If it's a clustering algorithm, we have only one metric to evaluate a model, that is a Silhote score. As we know that, clustering will create different clusters based on our similarities. So we can see the clusters created by model is a good only if the distance within the cluster should be very less and distance between the clusters should be very high. That means inter-cluster should be very high, intra-cluster should be very less. The next important thing, let's say for example, after you evaluate the model, if you feel like the model performance is very less, then we're gonna improve the model performance, we're gonna enhance the model performance using hyperparameter tuning. So we have a several methods like you know grid search CV and randomized search CV. What these two methods will do, it will choose all the possible combinations and it will select the best possible learning parameter which can enhance the model performance. Grid search will choose all the combinations, random search will choose only the random combinations. So hyperparameter tuning plays a very important role in uh, tree-based algorithms, which helps in enhancing the model performance. Insights and conclusion, the final thing what you have to do, once you try with all the machine learning model, you have to write in insights. Which model is doing good? Which model is doing bad? What are the challenges that you faced? What insights did you get from the entire approach? So that is insights and conclusion. So this is all about, you know, machine learning project approach or a machine learning project workflow. I hope it's clear. Thank you.